Today, sound the retreat, a market update for the 15th of January 2022. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, market volatility continued on Friday as US stocks retreated on wobbly economic news, showing how lingering shipping challenges, supply and labour constraints, the fastest inflation in decades and the Omicron variant are all weighing on activity. It's clear the ground is shifting under investors' feet Kelly Cox, US investment analyst at Etoro, said in a note. After all, the Fed's expectation went from no hikes in 2022 to four in a matter of a few months. This could be a big change in how investors view the risk and reward of different markets, and change can be uncomfortable. And several major bank stocks declined after their earnings reports. Bank stocks, which had outperformed in recent weeks as interest rates moved higher, were broadly lower as their reports appeared to underwhelm investors despite strong headline numbers. A warning from the largest US bank, JP Morgan Chase, is that future profitability may fall below a medium term target this year. And that really did cast a pall on the US equity market. Today's first earnings from the banks came in with varying cross currents. The major theme was loan demand is still not strong enough to outpace deposit growth, which means banks aren't in a position to take advantage of the steeper yield curve, said Keith Buchanan, portfolio manager at Global in Atlanta. The one thing that really jumps out is expense growth. You saw that in both Wells Fargo's and JP Morgan's numbers. Gerald Cassidy, large cap bank analyst at RBC Capital Markets, said on Squawk on the Street. Wells Fargo already had plans for future cost cutting, which might explain its outperformance on Friday, Cassidy said. JP Morgan Chase showed profit and revenue that topped estimates, but shares fell 6.15% to 157.89. The company's earnings were helped by a large credit reserve release, and CFO Jeremy Burnham warned that the company would likely miss a key profit target in the next two years. The company said compensation and other costs jumped in the fourth quarter, ahead of an expected surge this year. Citigroup stock fell 1.25% to 66.93 after the bank beat revenue estimates but showed a 26% decline in profits. Citigroup fell after posting a 26% drop in fourth quarter profit. And shares of Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs also declined. Meanwhile, shares of Wells Fargo added 3.66% to 58.05 after the bank's revenue topped expectations. CEO Charles Schwab said in a release that loan demand picked up in the second half of the year. You have the banks hit on their earnings today, and that's turned into a sell value by tech type of warning. And that's typically what we've been seeing, Dennis Dick, market structures analyst and proprietary trader at Bright Trading in Las Vegas, told Reuters. So the money just keeps rotating back and forth between value and growth. Now on the data front, Thursday's US producer price index grew 9.7% year over year and 0.2% month on month in December, while the core PPI grew 0.5% month on month and 8.3% year on year. The number of initial job claims was higher than expected, 230,000 for the week. And importantly, US retail sales stumbled at the end of 2021, factory output weakened and consumer sentiment deteriorated at the start of the new year, illustrating a loss of traction for the economy that many analysts view as temporary. Retail sales were down 1.9% in December, a worse reading than the 0.1% expected by economists. That's the most in 10 months, likely the result of Americans starting their holiday shopping in October to avoid empty shelves at stores. Still, economists point out that demand was pulled forward to prior months as consumers snapped up merchandise for holiday gift giving earlier than usual. The drop in December retail sales was broad, with 10 of the 13 major retail categories declining. 
At the tail end of the holiday shopping season, December is traditionally a solid month for retail sales, but concerns about shipping delays prompted many consumers to shop earlier than usual to ensure gifts arrived on time. And because the figures were adjusted for seasonal variations, the earlier shopping probably contributed to the weaker than expected figures. This is clearly not a great start to 2022, Jeffrey's economist Anita McQuesty and Thomas Simmons said in the note. That said, we remain constructive on the consumer for this year. That's because households have enough firepower in the form of cash savings and bargaining power to support a rebound in spending after Omicron's effect fade, they said. Also, employment gains and wage growth should provide even more support. On the upside, the current retail weakness will accelerate inventory rebuilding, which should help take the pressure off inflation. It doesn't necessarily soften the case for a March hike, but it reduces the tail risk of the Fed hiking more than four times this year, Jeffries said. But the University of Michigan's preliminary January Consumer Sentiment Index fell to the second lowest reading in the decade, while the Federal Reserve data showed production at the nation's manufacturers unexpectedly fell 0.3% last month. It showed the impact of higher inflation on sentiment and to some extent the spread of the coronavirus. Respondents said that they expect prices to rise 4.9% over the next year, matching the highest since 2008. Inflation over the next five to ten years is seen climbing at an annual pace of 3.1%. That's the most since 2011. Consumer sentiment fell in early January as inflation and Omicron fears mounted. That's depressing attitudes about personal finances. When asked about their finances, 33% reported being worse off than a year ago, just above the April 2020 shakedown level of 32%. It's even starker among cash-strapped families. Twice as many households with incomes in the bottom third as in the top third reported worsening finances, the report said. While Omicron's impact likely played a role, our take is that inflation is the more warranted concern with prices rising the fastest in nearly 40 years, Wells Fargo economist Tim Quinlan and Sarah Cotesis said in a report. Consumer discretionary stocks were under pressure after the report, with Bath and Body Works and Under Armour falling more than 4%, and shares in Peloton fell more than 3% after Nasdaq announced that the stock would be dropped from the Nasdaq 100 index. In other data news, business inventories for November came in higher than expected, but industrial production disappointed, declining 0.1% compared to a projected 0.2% gain. Producer prices climbed 0.2% in December for an annual increase of 9.7%, which is the largest since records were kept going back to 2010. Producer prices take the pulse of the private sector, which is battling elevated costs for transport and warehousing and a surge in the price of specialised fuels and lubricants. Factory activity took a hit last month as the surge in infections exacerbated manufacturers' ongoing struggles with materials and labour shortages. The Fed's figures underscore the long, slow path to normalising the mismatch in supply and demand in the goods sector. Omicron is just the latest hurdle as factory floor managers navigate the fallout of the spiking cases on workers and production schedules. The recent spread of the Omicron variant likely weighed on sales, but other factors also could be at work. Supporting the idea that this wasn't all a COVID story, consumers likely shifted shopping from in-person to online when the virus spreads, but non-store sales plunged 8.7% in December, according to JP Morgan analysis. Meanwhile, investors also digested the news that the US Supreme Court blocked a rule that would require 80 million workers to get vaccinated against COVID-19 or face periodic tests. That's a key component of President Joe Biden's vaccination push. Casino stocks were one bright spot, though, on Friday, after Macau's government announced it would allow just six casino licenses in the gambling hub. Las Vegas Sands surged 41.5% to 42.99, while Wynn Resorts gained 8.6% to 91.47. Shares of Netflix jumped 1.25% to 525.69 after announcing a price increase for US and Canadian subscribers, helping the Nasdaq outperform on Friday. The report followed a week where inflation data was a key factor in markets. On Wednesday, the Consumer Price Index showed a jump of 7% year-over-year. That's the highest reading in four decades. Thursday's Producer Price Index reported a rise of 9.7% over the same period. However, those results were better than some investors feared, helping markets stabilise this week. 
But it has been a rocky start to 2022 for investors. Tech stocks fell sharply in the first week of the year as the Fed signaled a more aggressive approach to inflation, accompanied by a spike in interest rates. Both of these moves partially reversed course earlier this week, but had snapped back by Friday afternoon. There's a thought that the pricing in of a more hawkish Fed is a process and not a week. Although a lot got done last week, this is going to be a process and I think we're probably going to have more volatile days in tech and growth stocks in general this quarter, said Elisa Levine, head of equities, capital markets advisory at BNY Mellon Wealth Management. The first quarter should be rising yields, rising rates, our performance of cyclicals, and we think that the long duration growth names are going to have a challenging quarter, Levine added. Elsewhere, shares of paint maker Sherwin Williams lost 2.81%, falling to 3846 after the company warned that fourth quarter earnings would miss estimates, citing issues in sourcing materials and staffing during the Omicron surge. A money management behemoth BlackRock posted earnings that beat on bottom line earnings but missed slightly on top line revenue. The shares fell 2.19% to 848.55, though it said its assets under management stood at 10.01 trillion US dollars at the end of the quarter, up from 8.68 trillion a year earlier. So that overall, the Dow Jones Industrial Average ended down 0.56% to 35,911 while the S&P 500 was down 0.08% to 4,662, and the Financial Services 500 Index was down 0.41% to 686.03. The tech-heavy Nasdaq Composite, though, was up 0.59% to 14,873. The stocks of US technology companies are seeing the worst start to a year since 2016, as fears about runaway inflation imperil the heady valuations left by the market's run-up over the past few years. Following multiple failed attempts this week to rally back strongly, investors remain hesitant to plough heavily back into shares of growth stocks, and there's still no major signs that the pressure on technology companies will abate any time soon. The Nasdaq 100 index, which includes some of the nation's technology behemoths, is down more than 4% this year, even after a bounce late on Friday that erased its losses from earlier in the week. The broader Nasdaq Composite index fell for a third straight week. High-flying growth stocks are being particularly hard hit by the growing conviction that the Federal Reserve will soon start withdrawing the massive monetary stimulus that has kept the financial system awash in cash since the pandemic hit. More than 36% of the stocks in the index are down at least 50% from their 52-week highs, an extraordinarily large number given the scale of the overall index drop, according to Ned Davis' research. Typically, when the Nasdaq is within 10% of its peak, an average of around 12.5% of its stocks have declined that much, the firm said. Worries about rising rates were fueled by data this week showing that US consumer prices soared last year by the most since June 1982, while US retail sales fell in December by the most in 10 months, indicating that higher prices may be dissuading consumers. That threatens to put further pressure on tech stocks with valuations based on future profit growth since high interest rates reduce the present value of those expected earnings. American savers piled into inflation-protected savings bonds, scooping up more in December alone than they'd had for any full previous year as consumer prices soared across the US. The government sold $2.78 billion worth of Series 1 savings bonds, which pay a fixed interest rate plus inflation in the month after selling $1.07 billion of the bonds in November, according to data from the Treasury Department. And the December figure is $1 billion more than the previous full year record, which came back in 2018 when a jump in oil prices drove inflation towards 3%. Annual inflation is running now at a four decade high of 7%, the result of booming consumer demand and supply chain snarls sparked by the pandemic. The yield on the US 10 year note surged 1.19% to 1.793. The two year was up 0.2% to 0.9696. Gold was down 0.22% to 1,817, and Bitcoin was trading near 43,000 US. Jamie Diamond said in a conference call with analysts after JP Morgan released its fourth quarter results I expect more interest rate increases than in the implied yield curve. My view is a pretty good chance that there'll be more than four. It could be six or seven. Diamond didn't specify how quickly, 
that might happen though. Inflation is shaping up as a defining issue of the midterm US elections as consumer prices in the world's biggest economy rage at a four decade high. And US Federal Reserve officials set the scene for at least three interest rate rises this year. Confronted with inflationary forces demanding a monetary response, President Joe Biden's nominee for US Federal Reserve Vice Chairman Lyle Brainard told her confirmation hearing before the Senate on Thursday in Washington that rates could rise as soon as the Fed's March meeting. That could be telegraphed even earlier when it resumes sitting on January 25th, 26th. Dr. Brainyard said controlling inflation was the most important task the Fed faced. The economy is a bigger issue for Americans than the coronavirus, according to pollsters, and the costs of living as holding back Mr. Biden's approval rating. Ipsos found that the economy ranks ahead of public health as a top issue facing America in a survey conducted from January 12th to 13th. YouGov, in separate polling from January the 8th to 11th, found inflation beat unemployment as the bigger concern, 41% to 11%, although a further 41% of respondents ranked them equally in importance. 54% of those surveyed described the inflation problem as very serious, and the same proportion identified inflation as the best measure of the economic health, ahead of the share market at 6% and jobs at 19%. While Dr. Brainard concurred that March was the probable timing to depart from the Fed's emergency rate settings, the fund's Fed rate is, of course, between 0 and 0.25%, the possibility of four rate rises was broached by Another Fed official this week, Patrick Harker, president of the Philadelphia Fed, said more than three increases might be necessary to keep the Fed in the inflation fighting game. Four is not out of the question in my mind, he said. We do need to take action on inflation. It is more persistent than we thought a while ago. The consumer price index is at a 39-year high, growing 7% in annual terms as of December after prices increased 0.5% last month. ANZ makes the case for five Fed raises this year, taking the Fed funds rate to 1.5% by the end of this year because it is already behind the curve, said Brian Martin, senior international economist. The market is roughly priced for four increases, pricing in 90.2 basis points or 0.9% worth of policy tightening. Predicting a further three rises next year, Mr Martin said that the Fed continues to underestimate the breadth and duration of intense inflation. The Fed's focus needs to be on getting inflation down quickly. The longer it waits, the higher the risk of a double-dip recession, and it will certainly need to act more aggressively if it delays, he said. The midterms are held in November, within a week of the Fed's November 1st and 2nd meeting. Historically, the midterm cycle does not play well with the equity market, according to MP Capital, with average peak to trough drawdowns of 17% for Wall Street, going back to 1950. Often that correction is met with a recovery. We are now entering a period where the Federal Reserve will engage in a never before seen experiment, rising interest rates of zero and reducing the size of its balance sheet in the same year, said Nicholas Coas, co-founder of DataTrek Research. The market is still left wondering what results will come from their decisions, he said. European bond yields also rose in choppy trading as investors stayed focused on monetary policies tightening by central banks. Those sharp falls in Germany's benchmark 10-year yield early this week led it to notch up its biggest weekly fall in 10 weeks. Meanwhile, the five-year Japanese government bond yield jumped to its highest since January 2016, and the yen rose after a Reuters report that the Bank of Japan policymakers are debating how soon they can start an eventual interest rate hike. Such a move could come even before inflation hits the bank's 2% target, some people said. The dollar which has been slugged by a three-day selling spree as investors bet that expectations of rate rises are already priced into the currency, finally steadied on Friday. The dollar index, which measures the greenback against a basket of six currencies, bounced 0.4% to 95.17, pulling away further from a two-month low hit this week. A bounce in the dollar dragged on the euro, which lost 0.32% to 1.1416, and sterling also slipped 0.21% to 1.3677, taking a breather after this week's rally that pushed it to a two-and-a-half-month high. 
GDP data on Friday showed that Britain's economy grew faster than expected in November and its output finally surpassed its level before the country went into its first COVID-19 lockdown. The UK economy grew by a much stronger than expected 0.9% in November. This positive news helped the FTSE outperform its major European peers, but despite November's growth acceleration, the country's GDP probably took a hit in December when the Omicron coronavirus variant first arrived in force. The FTSE slid 0.28% to 7,542. European stock markets weakened on Friday, continuing the global sell-off, with hawkish comments from Fed policymakers pointing to imminent interest rate hikes, while strong growth data helped the UK market outperform. The DAX was down 0.93% to 15,883. The overall tone in Europe is negative with Germany, the region's growth driver, reporting Thursday another record of more than 81,000 COVID-19 infections in a day. Hungary announced plans to make a fourth COVID shot available as cases soared, and the French Senate approved the government's latest measures to tackle the virus, including a controversial vaccine pass. In corporate news, Electre de France stocks slumped 14.59% after the energy giant issued a massive profit warning late on Thursday, saying new measures by the French government to cap retail electricity prices will hit it hard in 2022. Problems and its reactors also led it to cut its output forecast by nearly 10%. And elsewhere in energy markets, benchmark gas futures in northwest Europe jumped 10% as talks between the US and Russia over Ukraine broke down, followed by a widespread cyber attack on Ukrainian government websites. SAP was flat after the German business software group said fourth quarter revenue from its cloud computing business jumped 28% as more customers shifted their IT operations to its cloud-based database. It ended at 12048 and Experian stocks fell 3.66% despite the world's largest credit data firm reporting on Friday a 14% jump in its third quarter revenue as robust demand in North America compensated for weakness in its Europe, Middle East and African markets. It ended at 42.49. Asia-Pacific stocks were mostly down on Friday. China's Shanghai Composite was down 0.96% to 3,521. And data released earlier in the day showed that exports grew 20.9% year-on-year. Imports grew 19.5% year-on-year, and the trade balance, therefore, was $94.46 billion in December. China's struggling economy got some good news this week. Newly released data showed inflation is beginning to moderate more visibly, which should make it easier for the central bank to ramp up its support. Indeed, many think the support could arrive as early as this coming Monday, when 500 billion yuan of one-year loans the People's Bank of China extended to commercial banks matures. A number of analysts see the PBOC rolling over that money at a low interest rate, therefore inducing a reduction in borrowing costs that will ripple through the economy. And authorities in Beijing will also on Monday release the GDP data for the final quarter of 2021. Economists are expecting growth to have slowed to 3.5% from 4.9% in the third quarter, and that will add for the case for more easing. But nothing is that simple. With the US moving to tighten policy, it means the world's biggest economies could be heading in diverging directions for much of this year. The implications for currencies, capital flows and trade will be something Beijing and Washington will be watching keenly. And something strange has been happening with land sales in China. It's not the fact that fewer lots are being sold or that cash-strapped developers are staying away. It's who is doing the buying. Local government financing vehicles, or LGFVs, are firms set up by provincial, city or county level authorities to raise money for things like bridges, roads and airports. More recently, though, they've also become the biggest buyers of land sold by local governments. Effectively, officials are increasingly selling lots to themselves. China's commercial banks, however, are taking notice. At least five of the country's biggest state-run lenders have instituted tighter restrictions this year on lending to LGFVs for buying land. While that's good for limiting how much exposure banks have to risk, it could exacerbate the travails of local government. At least 23 of China's 31 provinces saw revenue from land sales fall in 2021 from 2020, according to Taifeng Securities. 13 of those saw income drop by more than 20%. 
Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index fell 0.19%, 24,383. And Japan's Nikkei 2 to 5 stood 1.28% to 28,124. And South Korea's Coast Buy fell 1.36% to 2,921, with the Bank of Korea hiking its interest rate to 1.25% as it handed down its policy decision earlier in the day. Oil futures settled higher on Friday, boosted by supply constraints and worries of a Russian attack on neighbouring Ukraine, pushing prices towards their fourth weekly gain, despite sources saying China is set to release crude reserves around the Lunar New Year. U.S. West Texas Intermediate gained 2.63% to 84.24, rising around 7% in the week. People looking at the big picture realise that the global supply versus demand situation is very tight, and that's giving the market a solid boost, said Phil Flynn, senior analyst at Price Futures Group. Flynn added that traders did not want to be short in the market as tensions mounted between Russia and Ukraine and ahead of the long US weekend for the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday, which typically sees lower trading volumes. US officials voiced fears on Friday that Russia was preparing to attack Ukraine if diplomacy failed. And Russia, which has massed 100,000 troops on Ukraine's border, released pictures of its forces on the move. There has been a bump up in the geopolitical risk factor that is boosting prices, said John Kilduff, a partner at Again Capital Management in New York. The dollar appeared headed towards its largest weekly fall in four months. A weaker dollar makes commodities more affordable for holders of other currencies, and several banks have forecast oil prices of $100 a barrel this year, with demand expected to outstrip supply, not least as capacity constraints among OPEC plus countries come into force. Libya's National Oil Corporation chairman Mustafa Shalala says oil prices were expected to continue to rise unless the market fundamentals change global investment increases, adding the oil output from the country totaled 1.045 million barrels per day. When you consider that OPEC Plus is still nowhere near pumping to its overall quota, this narrowing cushion could turn out to be the most bullish factor for oil prices over the coming months, said PVM analyst Stephen Brennock. Issues also remain unresolved in indirect talks between Iran and the United States on reviving the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. A source close to the talk said on Friday, if the United States lifts sanctions on Iran, the country could boost oil shipments, adding to global supply. And sources tell Reuters that China plans to release oil reserves around the Lunar New Year holidays between January 31st and February 6th as part of a plan coordinated by the United States with other major consumers to reduce global prices. China posted its first annual decline in crude oil imports in two decades, though traders expect imports to recover this year. And fuel demand was pressurised in the world's second biggest oil consumer as the Omicron coronavirus spread. Many citizens in Beijing have urged people not to travel during the Lunar New Year holiday. Now back in Australia, Australian shares capped their worst week since November on Friday, with tech stocks once again bearing the brunt of the sell-off, sending Afterpay to an 18-month low, while consumer stocks also took a battering. The S&P ASX 200 index fell 0.8% to 7,393 this week, with Friday's loss of 1.08% weighing heavily. The tech sector suffered heavy losses through the week, with the highest jump in US inflation in 40 years, reaffirming investors' expectations that central banks will begin to raise rates very soon. Zero tumbled 9% to 119.11. Afterpay lost 6.7% to 69.03, its lowest level since last July. Wise Tech Global dipped 6.8% to 52.13. Newex slid 5.2% to $2.01. And Nearmap fell 4.8% to one thirty-eight. Pendle Group shares tumbled 12.7% to $5 after a disappointing fourth quarter when the group's funds under management fell as clients withdrew their money from the investment manager. And healthcare stocks also came under pressure with CSL down 2.3% to $276, ProMedicus lost 13.9% to $46.59, Sonic Healthcare fell 9% to $40.79, Newsonics dipped 6.8% to $5.50 and Helios slid 7.1% to 469. Consumer stocks suffered as companies stepped up warnings of supply chain difficulties because of the rapid spread of the Omicron variant. Arbcorp 
lost 13.7% to 45.59. Reese slid 11.2%, 24.27. Domino's Pizzas fell 10.6% to 103.35. Ingham's Group declined 9.4% to 327. Collins Food dropped 8.3% to 1191. And Breville Group slipped 7% to 2884. And the banks also had a pretty wobbly week as well. The major miners countered the losing trend, buoyed by the strong price of iron ore. BHP Group climbed 6.7% to 46.68. Rio Tinto advanced a similar margin to 110.60. Fortescue Metals rose 4.9% to 21.37. And Mineral Resources firmed 11.1% to 65.62. AGL Energy helped offset some market losses, soaring 18.9% to $7.47. Because midweek, Credit Suisse said it was its top pick among Australian energy sector equities because of its advantage in low-cost coal supply. The smaller miners also ended the week higher with nickel mines, up 13.7% to 162, South 32 rose 6.6% 6 .6 to 418, and Liontown Resources climbed 11.4%. To dollar seventy-two, and finally, a single tweet by the CEO of the electric car maker Elon Musk sent meme coin Dogecoin surging by fourteen percent to zero point one nine eight eight on Friday. It ended up six point one seven percent at zero point one eight two three. That's against modest losses for Bitcoin and other cryptos across the rest of the week. It's been a bumpy year so far for the digital coins, of course. And what did he tweet? Tesla merch buyable with Dogecoin. Musk sent Dogecoin flying in mid-December after he announced Tesla would accept Dogecoin as payment for some merchandise. Tesla will make some merch buyable with Dodge and see how it goes, Musk tweeted at the time on Twitter. As for what merchandise specifically can be bought with Dogecoin, Tesla's website listed a cyber whistle for 300 dog on its website, while 12,020 dog will buy a cyber quad for kids. It wasn't the first time Musk has held Dogecoin fortunes in his hand. Last May, the memcoin slipped 40% after the influential CEO cracked a joke about it on Saturday Night Live. The mem coin's price had shot higher after Musk said Tesla would stop accepting Bitcoin as payment for its cars and said Dogecoin could be a better replacement. And this is a microcosm, really, of stupidity out there insofar that, of course, people react to these movements without really any underlying driver. And more broadly, you can see that the markets continue to wobble around. That's going to go in the same direction for a long, long time. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. And my own view is that it's too soon to say precisely how this is going to shake down. I still think there is a significant risk of a substantial fall in stock prices over the next few weeks. And if we do start to see considerable falls, then that will signal possibly a correction. But I also think more likely in the short term, we're going to see the odd day when things go higher and then lower. In other words, volatility will be the order of the day. And just remember this, many of the large players love volatility because they have automatic trading programs that can make money in a volatile market. So in a way, they don't care which way the markets end up. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.